Hey, thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry. I decided to shoot a video to show how I stabilize my portable equipment in a small shop. Anybody that's got a garage mahal with all their uh, big power tools bolted down, this video is not for you. But for the rest of us who need to have equipment that's portable for either pulling vehicles in and out or for changing operations in the shop, it's necessary that the equipment be both uh, portable but stable in use. And I want to show you how I manage that with a little invention that I call power tool parking brakes. The cool thing is that power tool parking brakes are stupid simple to make and you don't need much at all to make one in a minute. And on the other hand, if you're like me and tend to be a bit more, let's say, fastidious in the way you go about making things, I'll show you how I make these for the equipment here in the Next Level Carpentry Shop. To begin with, I like to start off with a nice piece of hardwood to begin with for two reasons. The first reason is that I can, and the second is that I'm able. Here I have a piece of African mahogany and a cool piece of spalted beech that I'm going to make into power tool parking brakes in this video. I'll make these pieces in to edge style parking brakes and I'll make this piece of spalted beach into an end style power tool parking brake that I need specifically for the Harvey G700 dust processor. The size of the piece isn't all that important but the ones I'm using are three inches wide and three quarters of an inch thick. For you metric folks I think that's about two meters thick or wait no two millicentimeters, just call it three quarters of an inch. And the length is determined by the wheels I'm stopping with these pieces. Using pieces that are flat, square, and straight, the first step is to cut a 45 degree bevel on the long edge of two pieces and on the end of the other piece. Notice that these bevels aren't being cut down to a sharp point, but I'm leaving about a strong eighth of an inch flat spot on the edge. And this part is part of the fastidious part where I run those long bevels over the joiner to remove saw marks on the beveled edge. And notice the push stick I'm using. It's the handle forward design of my favorite push sticks, which works really slick for a process like this. And can you imagine using a pair of those pokey little push sticks that you get with power tools? <laughs> yeah, me neither. Next, I draw a line an inch and a half from the bevel edge on one of the pieces and use that to set the blade depth on the table saw. Then I set the fence so that I'm making a very shallow but wide rabbit on the bevel edge and the bevel end of these power tool parking brake blanks. And this wide shallow rabbit serves as an indexing mark for the next step when I attach sheet metal to the bottom of these brakes. Various kinds of sheet metal will work for these parking brakes and the idea is to have the rabbit on the back of the blocks Match the thickness of the sheet metal you're going to be using. Here's a bit of extra caution when I run that shallow rabbet on the back of the end beveled piece to make sure I have firm control of the workpiece all the way through the cut. If you're uncomfortable with this, an auxiliary fence on a miter gauge would be the safe way to do it. This is what the rabbeting process looked like, but the first time I shot it, the camera was out of focus. So this is kind of a reenactment to give you an idea of what the rabbeting process looks like when done on a table saw. And now the bevels and rabbets on all three pieces match identically. And this is the point that I mark these pieces for length depending on what tool they're going to be used on. Uh, this one is going to stay full length. It'll block two wheels on my joiner. This one I think I'll cut into a 5 and a 10. And this piece is going to remain this length uh, to fit under my dust processor. I'll make the mahogany piece 17 and a half inches which leaves me a little extra so I can trim the ends nice and square. I've got enough length on the spalted beach to square up the ends and then cut one parking brake at 5 inches and the other at 10. So I have some versatility in the lengths. Now 
Next, I'll swing the saw to 45 degrees and use the slot on my zero clearance insert as a gauge to nip off the corners of the back edges and end at a consistent 45 degree angle on all the parking brakes. Using a simple visual alignment like this is a really quick way to get consistent cuts on all these corners. And I use this a lot when absolute precision isn't necessary. And I like it because it allows me to make that little special touch without the fuss of setting up a special stop for just a few cuts. Next, I'll lay out center marks and drill holes with a Forstner bit so that all these parking brakes have a handy little pickup hole for convenience during use. And I don't know about you, but I find it a lot easier to locate hole centers when drilling with Forstner bits if I pre-punch the centers with the sharp punch before taking them to the drill press. With this method, I can easily align a small spinning tip of the Forstner bit with that little punch hole to make sure these holes end up where I want them. It's a good idea to use a drill press drill speed chart to pick the right speed for the bit while drilling this wood. I'm going to go with about 600 RPM because the densities of these two woods are about halfway in between pine and oak. Just like that. And there's just something about the fulfillment of fastidiousness. Various kinds of sheet metal will work for these parking brakes. Aluminum is a good inexpensive choice and it comes in different thicknesses and different types. If I had enough of this stuff, I would use it for my blocks. But for mine, I'm going to end up using copper because I have some on hand. It works great and it looks pretty cool. I'll be using this three and a half inch wide strip because when I index it on the rabbit, it leaves about two inches hanging over, which is plenty for the power tool wheels to park on and engage the parking brake. I'll use this large pair of shears to cut pieces to approximate length and then use a spoon dolly, a ball peen hammer and a dense flat block of maple to flatten out the wrinkles in the strip before attaching it to the block. And it's kind of crazy because I've had these scraps of copper from a project I worked on back in about 1987 and they've been stored all these years waiting for a time just like this. Next I use a scratch awl to mark these pieces for length, a square to square them up and then snip them square with those big shears. And a scratch hole is so much more effective for marking accurately on sheet metal of all types, especially on copper. One edge of my strips is a little bit ragged, so I'll burnish it down with the shank of a scratch hole and then use a socket to scribe an arc on the corners that I'll trim off with a smaller pair of snips. And for everybody that's into the metric thing, you'll be happy to know that I'm using a 22 millimeter socket for these corners. Oh yeah, I'm moving uptown now. And I'll run a file along these edges once I get things put together to clean up the burrs and hopefully prevent lacerations. And I hope you're getting the idea here how a unique set of tools used in unusual ways can produce pretty cool results. And if there's tools you see here that you think you need and you don't have, check out the link in the, uh, in the video description. That's, there's an Amazon link there to the Next Level Carpentry Influencers page where I've got a lot of these tools listed. And remember those tools in those links uh, are the same low online price you expect, but Amazon pays ad fees to Next Level Carpentry. So I really appreciate it. And hope you find it a useful resource if you can't find that stuff locally. There's also a link to Teespring where you can get Next Level Carpentry t-shirts and swag, as well as a link for 15% off for all the fantastic Starbond CA glue products that I use and recommend here in the shop. I'm not really using them in this video, but you can still get 15% off any and all Starbond products for the accelerators and the glues by using special offer code NLC at checkout at starbond.com. That is in the video description as well. Now that I've got these pieces trimmed to length, it's time to attach them to the blocks. The copper strips will get attached to the underside of the parking brakes with number six by half inch Phillips flathead screws. So I'm going to put a mark three quarters of an inch along the edge and then put some marks along the line for screw placement. Because the wood block has a small eighth inch face on it, I'm able to clamp it in my bench vise for installing these strips of copper. The rabbited edge serves as a reference line for placement of the copper and then I use a tiny carbide tip snappy bit to drill pilot holes and countersink to these number six by five eighths flathead Phillips screws. When done properly, the screw heads seat nice and flush to even this thin sheet of copper, holding it firm when their heads are perfectly flush. And those simple but important steps are all it takes for installing the copper strips on these power tool parking brakes. And once I've got everything set up, I just rinse, lather, repeat 
and install the copper strip on the rest of my blocks with a little trouble and little time. It doesn't bother me in the least if I need to back out a screw, rework the countersink, and then re-drive the screw to get it all nice and flush when it's done. Now that the fabrication and assembly work is done, I'll take a minute to thank all the patrons on Patreon. While Chip removes the pieces of copper from all these power tool parking brakes and runs around all the edges with an eighth inch roundover bit to smooth them up a little bit, you can see a scrolling list of all the active patrons who've gone above and beyond to support Next Level Carpentry. We're out here working in the shop, producing videos, and you guys got our backs there supporting the channel, so we really appreciate it. It'll take Chip a few minutes to detail out all those parts. So I'll remind the new patrons that there's a growing list of patron-only videos there on Patreon. When you become a member of the Above and Beyond Club, you can get a behind-the-scenes look into the shop and job sites here at Next Level Carpentry with a little bit of extra detailed information that I don't include in videos here on YouTube. I hope you find that content special and take it as a token of my appreciation for what you do for this channel. For everyone else, I hope you'll consider subscribing to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. It's free, you know, and as those subscriber numbers go up, YouTube pays attention to what's going on here at Next Level Carpentry and helps promote the videos that helps build the channel. And now that Chip is wrapped up, I think we'll just beam him up and then I'll get on to sanding those blocks before I put a little gel varnish on them to finish up. All right, Chip. See ya. <laughs> All these pieces come out of the DW735 thickness planer in really excellent shape. So all I need to do to prep them for putting gel poly on them is to remove pencil marks with my oops eraser and then give them a quick once over with 220 grit sandpaper on a gator sanding block. And they're good to go. To put a finish on these parking brake blocks, I'll be using the satin finished Old Masters gel polyurethane. It's a perfect finish for this sort of project because it goes on quick, it's fairly durable, and it's easy to touch up if you ever need to. Not that I'll be touching up these blocks, but you get to see how this stuff looks and works. And if I've said it once, I've said it before. Finishes come out best when they're done with soon-to-be world-famous Lintz Brothers Pizza Boxes protecting my work surface. And you gotta just love how that gel poly makes that wood grain pop and come alive. Pretty sweet. After burnishing up these copper pieces with both the coarse and the medium Sandflex blocks, I give them a generous coat of Johnson's Paste Wax to slow down future tarnishing and to prevent fingerprints while I clean up the edges with a file and then follow that with a light pass from a deburring tool to remove the pokies that could potentially pierce my pinkies. Gotta love the way that copper shines with a little bit of polish to it. A smooth file clamped in a vise makes it easy to clean up the edges of these pieces so they're flat, smooth, and consistent. The teeth of the fine file quickly remove the jittery edges made by the snips. And then the deburring tool removes the slightest bit of a burr on the edges. Nice. <sighs> oh, just kidding. <laughs> now that the gel poly has had a chance to dry overnight, I give it a light buff with the world's finest sandpaper to bring out a little bit of sheen and a true luster to these pieces. And I don't know how this will show in the video, but I can assure you that it looks as good to me as it does in the video, and it feels even better. These pieces are buttery smooth, and I'm happy. Cardboard makes a great surface for final assembly, and Lids Brothers Pizza Box cardboard is second to none, so I'm using it for the final assembly of these power tool parking brakes. Because, quite ironically, it keeps anything crusty on the surface of my assembly table from scratching these pieces here at the final step. So, I guess this is kind of a statement about the quality of crust down there at Lids Brothers too. I think it'd be fair to say that assembly is the final topping on these little blocks. So now I'm going to show you what they look like in action. A short block is ideal for a single wheel like the table saw here. The 10 inch size gives me a little bigger target to hit with the pivoting caster wheel on the far end of my outfeed table. And because there's not too much weight on this end of the saw, the parking brake slides a little bit. But that's not a problem because in use, there's always more weight involved, and the more weight, the better the brake works. And keep in mind that the parking brake on this wheel is already engaged, and it still rolls this easily. So my wheel stop is definitely adding resistance to the rolling action of the table saw. 
This is the custom welded mobile base that I built for my Powermatic PJ882 joiner. I initially designed these parking brakes to work specifically for this joiner. It's super heavy and I always need to reposition it for the work I'm doing, but even with all its massive weight, the thing rolls pretty easily on the floor without a parking brake in place. There's a fixed caster at both corners of this mobile base, which is why I made this parking brake extra wide to catch both of those casters at the same time. The massive weight of the joiner and the momentum of sliding it onto the parking brake causes it to slide a little bit. But once the wheels engage the beveled slope on the parking brake, the movement is arrested effectively. And it takes a real shove to get it to budge when the parking brake is in place. You can see wheel marks in the copper and scratch marks on the bottom. And this is why a softer metal like copper or aluminum is a better choice for these because that provides some grip on the concrete surface. And last but not least is my Harvey G700 dust processor. It's got a single caster wheel for pivoting the machine around which gives it great maneuverability. But because I've got to park it on a sloped section of my garage floor, it takes off across the shop without a wheel chock. I'll let that demonstration of using these power tool parking brakes be the wrap up for this video. Now that you've seen how they're made and how they can be used and what they do. I will mention that the benefit of these blocks versus just putting a piece of wood behind the wheel is that the little uh, lip on there prevents it from being easily kicked out. If you just use a wedged block of wood, it'll stop the machine. But if you walk by and kick that little wedge, uh, then your parking brake has been released and tools can take off on you. And don't ask me how I know that. Anyways, I want to thank you for watching this video, spending some time here at Next Level Carpentry, and until next time, thanks for watching. I would be remiss if I was forgetful and forgot to mention my appreciation for the good folks at the Department of Redundancy Department who have sponsored this video. And they asked me to make you aware of their mission statement, which is, we believe that a little bit of repetition never hurt anyone because it's harmless.